this video tutorial we will look at the hardware basics or what's inside the box which is the central processing unit stay tuned in our previous lessons we went through what computers can do and remember the four basic functions of any computer is one to receive input which is to accept information from the outside world two process the information which is perform arithmetic or logical operation on the information so for example if i plug in one plus one the computer is going to process that information and produce the output which is two so the third basic operation of the computer is to produce output which is to communicate information to the outside world and then we have the fourth operation which is to store the information store and retrieve information from memory and storage devices so nothing is temporary sometimes you could save it permanently whether it's in your computer's memory such as the hard drive or in a flash drive an external drive and so forth we continue to talk about what computers do based on the hardware components. We have input devices, output devices, microprocessor or the CPU or the central processing unit, memory and storage devices such as primary storage such as ROM and RAM and secondary storage disks such as disk drive and peripherals such as your um, external hard drive, flash drive, etc. Other peripherals include your printer, your scanner, your mouse, anything that is not dealing with the CPU but we just plug in to use as a complement to the computer. So now we can ask the question, how do computer circuits manipulate data? And you may ask the question, I wonder how the computer will understand what I read or what I type to it. Basically all computers are electronic digital devices. Digital device meaning it works only with discrete data such as digits 1 and 0 or like a light switch on and off. And this is where we talk about binary digits. These 1s and zeros are referred to as binary digits or shortened to bits. Now this is nothing technical. Basically the computer can only, only understand machine language which is discrete data and when we type in our English language in the computer, the computer will process it into machine language or discrete data which consists of binary digits in order for the computer to understand and manipulate it and then it will come back to us as information that we could understand. Computer uses sequences of bits to digitally represent numbers, letters, punctuation marks, music, pictures and videos so depending on what we type or what we enter into our system the computer will manifest it to be and to mean a host of binary digits one and zeros okay so a letter a punctuation mark music pictures videos whatever it is the computer will analyze it based on binary information and then it will relate us back to what we can understand which is the information now we move on to bit basics and bit is from binary and digit is the first letter of binary and the last two letters of digit and we get bit bit is the smallest unit of information computers can process it can have one of the values either zero or one a byte on the other hand is a collection of eight bits so eight bits make up a byte and one byte is the one bit sorry is the smallest unit of information a computer can process a byte can represent 256 different messages okay so basically 256 is basically 2 to the power of 8 2 multiplied by 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 2 will give us 256 so basically 8 bits make a byte and a bit is the smallest unit of information that the computer can understand. Bits as numbers. This denotes all numbers with combinations of zeros and ones. Okay? So a bit will never be a figure 6, 7, 8 or 9. It will either be a 1 or a 0. 
Decimal numbers automatically converted to binary binary numbers processing hidden from user. So binary number, the processing of binary digits uh, in the background of the computer. The user do not see it. Basically, every action you perform on a computer, whether it is to watch this video tutorial, you load a web page, or to download a work, to type a document, you need to use bits and bytes. Okay? And the computer will process this information to bits and bytes in which it can understand, but again, you wouldn't know this because this is just how the computer works. But at the end of it, it will relay the information you want. We have a table here with decimal binary and a decimal and a binary again. Zero, and the binary will be four zeros. One, it will be three zeros and one one. Two, because it is number two, it changed the position then of the second digit and is now one zero. Three will now upgrade the last digit to one. And four will mean zero one zero zero. And this pattern continues. It keep adding one to every sequence until it reach one zero zero one in the ninth decimal. Now we look at bits as codes, and a code represent each letter, digit, and special character. ASCII or ASCII is most widely used. Each character is a unique eight-bit code. For example, the letter A, as you can see on your right. Uh, the code under the ASCII language it will be 01000001 so every time you type the letter A that code will come up for the computer to understand again you cannot see these codes but it's there okay there are 256 unique code for 26 letters 10 digits and special characters so we have letters A to Z number 0 to 9 or up to 10 digits and then special characters such as the number sign question mark and asterisk we also had unicode which supports more than 100,000 unique characters so this is just a representation to show you that if we type the word apple on, the, on microsoft word the computer will understand it as the binary digits we see so for the letter a it will be 0100001 and for the letter P, if you look down on the list, it's 01010000, right? And P again will be 01010000. L will be 01001100. And if you watch, and the unique thing about this, not all of them have the same readout. They are all different in their own way. Now we look at the CPU, which is also the real computer. So this is the real brain box behind what you've been seeing. Remember that big tower is not the CPU, that's just the shell of the outline, okay? That's just the house then for the, the processor or the CPU. The CPU is often called the processor. It performs transformation of input into output. So when we input data, it outputs the information. The CPU interprets and executes instructions in programs. So if we want to close Microsoft Word, the CPU interprets that and executes it. If you want to open Microsoft Word, the CPU will do so. It performs arithmetic and logical data manipulation. So if you're dealing with different characters, keys, and numbers, they, it will understand that. And uh, before we look at the binary code on the ASCII, which is a type of language, and this is what the computer will understand. The, com the CPU communicates with other parts of the system directly and indirectly through memory. So if you send something to print, again, it will not happen until the processor executes the instruction to the device. Okay? So yeah, we see a bunch of plugs. You plug in your printer to a USB drive on your computer and it prints something. But what we're talking about is the background of the computer. Who gives the instruction to the printer to print the particular format and settings that you want it to be printed on? Okay? So we have also the modern processor. And this is a complex collection of electronic circuits. CPU housed with other chips on a circuit board. And the circuit board containing the CPU is called the motherboard. So the motherboard is like the life of the computer. They always have the saying, if your motherboard dies, your computer dies. Because it's on the motherboard. It's like the motherboard is like a plate 
where all the chips and processors and so forth is connected to. So when we talk now about the performance of a processor, some processors are faster than others and it could be determined by a lot of factors such as the speed of the internal clock in the processor and this is measure, measured by gigahertz so sometimes when you're uploading and downloading music you'll see ghz next to it that means the speed okay at which the processor works then the architecture of the processor so who makes the processor how it is designed okay so basically the processor is will determine how the computer run if you have a Dell computer, you might have a iCore, a Core i5, i3, a 7 generation, and so forth. Okay? The number of bit processors can process at one time. So, basically, your processor will show its performance and level at which it is based on how much work does that it does. Okay? Whether it, it's 32 or 64 bits. And the 64 bits, obviously, the higher will mean the better it functions so if you're looking to buy a processor you need to look at how fast it moves who makes it and the brand of it and how it functions and the number of bits the processor can process at one time now we'll continue talking about the performance of processors and there are many processors that we need to make note of and the first one is multi-core processors on the multi-core processors, we have the single chip contains multiple CPUs or cores. It runs simultaneously, right? So a multi-processor will have four processors, as you can see on my right, on your screen as identified. So you have CPU 1, CPU 2, CPU 3, and 4. And they all run simultaneously and they divide the work. Most new PCs have at least two cores, okay? Quad core becoming is becoming common. So long ago computers had one CPU, now it have four, and the bigger the computer and the size of the work is going to have more. Quad core is just a computer then that is a multiprocessor, meaning it have four processors running for one system. And as such they, they run simultaneously, they divide the work and it executes instruction way more faster than just one. So how does the CPU work? how it works right typical CPU is divided into several functional units so one CPU is divided into the control unit the arithmetic logic unit or the ALU and we spoke about this in our previous lesson it speaks about the decode unit the bus unit and the prefetch unit these units work together to complete the execution of programs and instructions so the CPU must do all these functions in order to execute tasks Here we talk about the computer's memory and two key terms that we need to understand when we talk about the computer's memory is random access memory and read only memory. Random access memory is a common type of primary storage. Stores programs and instructions and data temporarily. Memory locates locations have unique addresses and it is volatile meaning it disappear when power is turned off. So if you switch off your computer, everything will be lost. It's called the IMMS rated by both size and speed. Okay, so it's the most common type of primary storage. Basically, if you store a Word document, um, it will store temporarily, okay? This is random access memory and we use it every day in our computer. Now we have the other type of, com of the computer's memory and that is read-only memory or ROM. And here information is etched on chip when manufactured. It stores startup instruction and other critical information. Basically the ROM will have all the information that the computer requires to process data into information and so forth. It is not volatile memory, meaning if the computer cuts off it won't be lost. It is always there and it is stored in the chip of the computer. We now have flash memory and this can be written and erased repeatedly. This is like a read and write CD that we used to have long ago. When you burn a CD, you can erase it and burn something else on it. Right? The use, this is used for digital camera, cell phone and handheld computers now. So now we have something called a memory card 
that we could take it out of our phone flash it clear it and then continue using it over and over because the storage is 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 our, like, let's say 64 gigabytes of storage on your phone when that fills you empty it and it can be used again and this is what we call flash memory when dealing with the memory of a computer we need to also take into consideration the memory cache and cache used by the central processing unit of a computer to reduce the average time to access memory the cache is a smaller faster memory which stores copies of the data from the most frequent used main memory location so for example if every day you have to use a program to calculate bills and you have to use this particular formula every day then the cache the memory will the, the memory of the cache will have that particular instruction for the computer to just grab and go the cache is likely safe place for all the frequently used instruction that the user would would apply to the computer when the processor needs to read from or write to a location in memory it first checks whether a copy of that data is in the cache if it's in the cache it's like we pull it out faster and if if not any cache would have to go to the main memory if so the processor immediately reads from or writes to the cache which is much faster than reading or writing from the main memory okay so we also have cache um, in our web pages because sometimes we have frequently visited sites so if every day we use Microsoft Outlook and then we go to Facebook and then we go to Twitter and we have different web pages coming up then the memory of that will be stored so it will be easier access on your browser sometimes when your browser don't work properly there is a clear cache and in, in terms of your phone as well there is the cache and sometimes when we clear it a lot of um, space is relieved from the phone because the cache also stores data so sometimes if you want to add space to your phone as a device and you clear out your memory card and they're still saying you have a certain percentage again left to store on your phone, the best thing to do is clear the cache, which is like repeated information that you would have in your main memory. So there's no information lost, but it will help. When looking at computer, we also speak about buses. And no, not the bus we take to go to school, but the bus which travel information between the different components. So information travels between components on the motherboard through wireless wires called internal buses or just buses. Typically have 32 or 64 wires, which are the data parts. Buses now are bridged between processor and RAM. So how does the information reach from one to the next? Well, they use the bus, just like you would go from one location to the next, you would use a bus. The bus then acts as this bridge or transportation medium between the processor and RAM. Bus speed is one of the most important factors in determining a computer's performance. So before you buy a computer, you need to ask the vendor what is the speed of the bus and if it's 32 then it's lower but 64 is always a higher one okay buses to connect to storage devices in base expansion slots and external buses and ports so these are the main ones that we use every day in our computer now we talk about ports and computer have has a variety of ports to meet diverse needs we have video ports to connect monitors we have audio ports to connect speakers or headphones so if you look to the side of your laptop and you see places where the charger plugged on as a port the place where a headset will go in that is also a port and a usb port is where you would stick your flash drive you'll connect your printer and so forth right so the ports are literally the docking of the devices and the peripherals of the computer so you want to use your printer you plug it to the usb this is a port your headset is another port your microphone is another port okay so USB ports to connect keyboard pointing devices or mouses, printers, cameras, disk drives, portable storage devices and more. So the ports is very important. When you're buying a laptop or a computer, you need to find out how many ports it have. When I was choosing my laptop, I make sure that I had enough USB ports. And the reason for this is because sometimes I have two or more external 
hard drives in which I retrieve my work from and sometimes I could use them simultaneously so if I have enough ports to work with I can be more effective then I wouldn't have to unplug and replug and unplug and replug like in terms of frustration right so again I bought a laptop with five USB ports and this helps me tremendously in terms of how I do my work so now we go on to find out which computer to buy. So here's where IT actually makes sense in the real world because sometimes people buy computers and they don't know nothing. Because the computer looks nice, they buy it. But really and truly, you need to watch the processor and the features of the computer in order to determine. So we have here a Dell A1 which is 3.3 gigahertz, Intel 6 gigabytes RAM for $599. Here we have uh, Dell A2 for 2.8 gigahertz, 4 gig gigabytes of RAM for $7.99. They both have 3 years warranty, both have 15 inch display, both have Windows 7. Except the one for $599 has a 750 gigabyte hard drive, 750 gigabyte hard drive, and the more expensive one has 500. Obviously, we will go with the, the computer that is worth $599. And I'm not saying because it's cheaper. Yes, price is one. But the fact that it's now 3.3 gigahertz, which is more than the A2, and it is 750 gigabytes, mean there is 250 more gigabytes of inter internal storage. So we will go with Dell A laptop. And we continue with the same one, now the slides change and you'll see the, the red parts is telling you more about it. Um, which computer to buy? Here we have the 3.3 and 6 gigabyte and the 2.8 and 4 gigabyte. But the cheaper one have a 32 bit processor and the more expensive one have a 64 bit processor and this is important. The cheaper one have a 32 bit 400 megahertz bus and the more expensive one which is the a2 has a 64 bit one have a 2 gigabyte cache and one have a 3, 4, 3 gigabyte or 3.3 gigahertz cache so here now we will go with the more expensive one because it have a 64 bit processor 64 bit 800 megahertz bus and a 3 gigabytes 3.3 gigahertz l2 cache so we will go with the dell a2 as you can see on the right okay so before we saw the slide um, based on price and you know everything look better any more cheaper one but when you think about the processor that is a main component when determining to buy a laptop and this will be one of your exercises I'm going to pull ads from different computer places based on different computers and for all you're going to make a choice and tell me which one to buy now we touch on a topic called green computing when compared to other industries, the computer industry is relatively easy on the environment. The manufacturer and use of computer hardware and software does have a significant environmental impact. You have some control over the environment, of environmental impact of your computing activities. When we talk about buying a computer, we think about buy green equipment, meaning equipment that we can dispose of and it will not harm our environment. It would not clog our drains, etc. I mean, even if we're supposed to find a proper mechanism and channel to dispose the waste. Do we need to take advantage of energy saving features? So there is this big star and sticker on the side of your computer, energy saver or green energy. This is important. This this will determine how much current is actually pulled by a device to use. And the more you pull, the more electricity bill might be. We want to save energy, not screens. Okay? Avoid moving parts. So we could avoid moving the parts around. Sometimes some computer parts can be very hazardous and we need to take extra care. So this was my video tutorial then on inside the box which is hardware basics dealing with the cpu and we went through back what the, the four basic operations of a computer and we went on to what is a bit and a byte but more than ever we focus on the computer's memory right so i want you to make sure and pause the video and take your relevant notes and 
Once completed, you can attempt the exercises that I have posted for you. So thank you for watching this video tutorial.